somewhere. Where'd that thing go? This one. Hey, hey, hey. Let's see if it works. Haha, <laughs> death to math educators. Let's see here. Ah, hooray. So again, this is chapter 12 in the text. There's like 12 point, I think 12.1 to 12.4 is the large discussion here. But uh, the, so we, we kind of, um, we look at a slightly more general situation than just, we've been solving linear systems of differential equations, right? But a generalization of that would be dx dt equals to f of xy, dy dt equals to g of xy. This is called an autonomous system. Um, for example, we just had like f of xy equal to x plus 3y and g of xy was, what was it? It was like minus 3x minus 2y. Those are specific examples of autonomous. Every, the, the systems we've been solving, homogeneous second order ones, have all been autonomous systems of two different equations to unknowns. Now, one thing you could do to study this is to eliminate time. You could look at dy dx as being basically think about dy dx so dy dt over dx dt we studied parametric calculus in calculus 2 we learned that dy dx for the parameterization um, is given by the the y derivative divided by the x derivative of the parameterized curve so you could study autonomous systems by instead studying dy dx equals to g over f this is sometimes called the phase plane equation integral curves to this will be parameterized by solutions to one Anyway, so that, that we'll, we'll come back to this when we have more time to talk about that more systematically, maybe tomorrow. Um, but, you know, you can start looking at some of the basic kinds of systems, right? Like, we've got dx dt equals to minus y, dy dt equal to x. This has solutions, sines, and cosines. We talked about this the other day. You suggested I solve for dt in this example. Yeah. Um, so that has solutions which are circles. Again, the origin is a critical point. Um, let's see here. Uh, we could have, so I just have some, some further examples. I'm sorry, I need to get, get to the point here. We're almost out of time. Here's another one. dx dt equals 2y, uh, dy dt equals to 2x. Again, to get both of these to zero, what do we have? We have, the origin is our critical point, right? To get dy dt and dx dt both zero, we need x and y both zero. The origin's a critical point. And, you know, you have some solutions flowing into the origin, right? Some solutions flowing out. So this is much like the example that we were just looking at in my notes, right? The origin's unstable, right? How about that circle one? If I'd drawn the picture for it, would it have been stable or unstable? What do you think? Ah, here's the picture I was looking for. So here's generally what can happen for a, for a system. These are your flavor options, so to speak. If you have a critical point, maybe you've got all the solutions flowing into the critical point, that would be a asymptotically stable or stable node. Uh, I guess asymptotically stable is the... Um, you could have something where you're spiraling out of the origin, right? If you give your, your solution a little nudge, you're going to spiral out. That would be unstable spiral. You could have a saddle point or an unstable point which has this situation where you go out some directions, you go in others, right? Just like Calc 3. Um, you can have a center, which is just a plain old stable point. That dx, the, um, dx dt equals minus y, dy dt equals to x, the one that had circle solutions, that had the origin as a stable point. Um, you can also have a stable spiral where all the solutions spiral into the origin. That's another thing that can happen. Um, you can have an unstable node where all the solutions flow out from the origin. Here's the neat thing, guys. All of these cases for a linear homogeneous problem, you, you can completely decide which case you're in by just looking at the eigenvalues alone. Let me break it down for you. This case would be when both of the eigenvalues are real and negative. You have c1 e to the minus eigenvalue plus c2 e to the minus other eigenvalue times some vectors. What happens as time goes to infinity? 
flow into the origin, right? If, on the other hand, you have alpha plus I beta T, where alpha is, is positive, that would be this case. E to the alpha T times sines and cosines. If alpha is positive, the radius, in some sense, is getting bigger and bigger. That's an unstable spiral. This one, a stable um, saddle, would be something like where you have one positive eigenvalue and one negative eigenvalue. Just like the example we were looking at in the notes, we had an eigenvalue of, what was it? Like 1 and minus 3, I forgot now, but the last one we were looking at, we had a positive and a negative eigenvalue. That's going to give us a, sta a saddle point, an unstable critical point. Center stable. This is the case of pure imaginary eigenvalues. This gives us elliptical orbits around the, stable, around the center for a homogeneous system of differential equations. Stable spiral, this would be something like we have a complex eigenvalue, but the real part is negative. That means the radius, like e to the minus alpha t essentially serves as a radius for the solutions. And as, as time goes to infinity, that e to the minus alpha t term, I mean, e to the alpha t becomes, if alpha is negative, that goes to zero. That's the stable spiral. And this one would be the case that both of the eigenvalues are real and they're positive. That means as time goes to infinity, your solution flows away from the origin to infinity. Which case you're in geometrically is completely governed by the structure of the eigenvalues. You can actually see it. You can actually see it for systems of two differential equations and two unknowns, but the story I'm telling you holds for systems with more differential equations. I can't visualize three equations or four equations and four unknowns very well, but Basically, the same story holds. If all of the eigenvalues are real and negative, the origin is a stable node, uh, asymptotically stable. Everything flows into there eventually. If you have you know, all of the eigenvalues being uh, imaginary, then it's going to be a stable center. Actually, I haven't really thought through it very carefully for three, or four, but three by three or four by four systems, so let me not try to blather on about it. I'll forget some case or something, um, say something impossible. Um, but um, that's it for that. So, one of the really neat things that we can do, and I don't think I've done that for you guys yet. Sometimes the semesters flow together for me, you know, but um, it turns out we can, we can do this kind of phase plane analysis for Newton's equations. I'll come back to that another day, maybe tomorrow, it's called energy analysis. I haven't done energy analysis yet in here, have I? I don't think so. I did it towards the end of the spring semester. That's what's messing with my head because I was teaching differential equations last semester. So sometimes, you know, stereotypes. I think you guys are the same guys, but that's, you know, my bad. Yes, yes. Let's see here. Um, let's try this out here. So here we're looking at dx dt is x squared minus y squared and dy dt is y plus 3. Where's the critical point? Or is there more than one? If it's not, if it's a nonlinear differential equation, you can have more than, you can have multiple critical points. This one just has one critical point because you see dy dt is y plus 3, when's that 0? y has to be what? Negative 3. If y is negative 3, that means x squared, oh, maybe it has 2. If, so we have x squared minus 9 equals to 0, so x must be plus or minus 3. It seems to me 3 minus 3 or minus 3 minus 3, these should be the two critical points. And maybe we can see that if I chose the scale right. Oh, my, my scale is wrong to see it. Let's, let's do 10. Yeah, be careful, right? If you're looking in the wrong place, you'll miss things, right? But I think if we do 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, that should, that should be, should be lovely. There we go. So where did I say they should be? Like three, what did I say? Three, I just start clicking, we'll find them. Reveal yourselves. Where are you, critical points? It starts to become obvious where they are, doesn't it? Can you see them?
Yeah, so the critical point, yeah, here and here, just like we said, plus or minus 3 and minus 3. Now, what do you th are these, what, what's the nature of these critical points? This one, we're, we're flowing, looks like we're flowing towards it this way, right? But away from it that way, this is unstable. How about this one? Away, away, it looks... So this, this is unstable, unstable saddle, right? And this is unstable, what do we call it? Um, it's a different kind of unstable, right? But here the solutions just flow away. Here you have a, a saddle. So Anyway, so we can use p-plane to look at differential equations to, to find critical points and to classify their nature. This, of course, is interesting because if you have a physical system and you want to know if you start with some initial condition, what's the end point of your application, well, this kind of analysis becomes important, right? And there's also the more general study of something called chaos, right? Chaos, in a nutshell, is sensitivity to initial conditions. So chaos is something like when a really, really small change in initial conditions produces an entirely different outcome. If your system has that feature, it has chaos. Right? That would be very annoying in your daily life, right? Like you're, you're hanging out with your girlfriend, you have a conversation, She's fine. The next day, you, have, you thought the same conversation, but things go nuts. That's an example. Chaos. So you've experienced chaos, right? Some of you know? <laughs> Sorry. I will stop with my sexist examples. It could be a girl and a boyfriend, if there were girls here. But anyway, I shut up. So I think that's enough for today. I'll let you go four minutes early. I mean, we started five minutes late, so...